I'm Matt Reynolds, and this is my podcast. I can do the job, but running the business is quite difficult. What a lot of tradesmen lack, and I was probably one of them, is business skills. I don't mind making mistakes. You learn from your mistakes. Information is all around you in the minds of people that work beside you. This is episode 23 of Trench Talk. I'm Matt Reynolds. I'm a plumber from Melbourne, Australia, and I know it's episode 23 because I've been holding on to this one for quite a while. My guest is Roland Lazenby, the author of the biography, Michael Jordan, The Life. Many of you know I'm a long-time Michael Jordan fan, so I was pretty excited to talk to Roland after I initially reached out to him for some information about the unpublished pages of his book. It was Roland who, at the end of this chat, which we recorded back in the beginning of 2016, suggested that I should start a podcast. I was a little slow to take up his advice, but now at 23 episodes in, I have him to thank for the original idea. So this is actually my very first official interview, although I didn't know it at the time. The audio is a little sketchy in parts because I was still trying to figure out recording over Skype back then, but the low quality sections do pass pretty quickly, and this remains one of my favorites so far. The idea of the discussions on this podcast, Trench Talk, for those of you joining us for the first time, is to go into the trenches of achievement and talk, not with people who are orchestrating from some lofty perspective, but to those high performers who are actually in the trenches honing their craft. That has included guests from the worlds of business, sport and entertainment, all of whom are on the front lines doing amazing things. Roland is a great guy who has been extremely generous to me with his time. He's a veteran NBA reporter who has travelled with some of the league's most famous and successful teams, including Michael Jordan's Chicago Bulls, the Bad Boys of Detroit, the Pistons, and Kobe Bryant's LA Lakers. He's completed hundreds, probably thousands in reality, of interviews with stars of the NBA, including over 400 hours for his Kobe Bryant biography alone. Roland has written a ton of books, including biographies on New England Patriots quarterback Tom Brady, Dallas Cowboys superstar Emmett Smith, the NBA's most winning coach in terms of championships Phil Jackson, Hall of Fame Laker Jerry West, and many, many more. In our chat, we covered a lot that is the character of Michael Jordan. Roland dove deep to put this book together, and it's by far and away the most comprehensive piece I've ever found on the famous number 23. We discussed the Jordan family, pre-Michael, cultural change in America, the Nike shoe deal, how the company marketed MJ, why he wanted to leave them but couldn't, winning and becoming one of the most famous people on the planet. If you're in business, a sports fan or are interested in any form of improvement, including your own performance, I think you'll find this interview, like Roland's book, very motivating. You'll hear during this chat, remembering that this episode was recorded in early 2016, Roland is unable to talk about his then upcoming biography on Kobe Bryant called Showboat. Showboat has since been released, but I wanted to put this episode you're getting today out, so Roland agreed to do a second episode for Trench Talk just a couple of weeks ago, and I'll publish that in the next few days, so you'll get all the Kobe information in that upcoming episode. An easier way of saying all that may be that it's a two-part chat recorded 18 months apart that I'll release probably within the same week. You can buy both books, Michael Jordan, The Life, and Showboat, The Life of Kobe Bryant, basically anywhere, including Amazon. To connect with Roland, head to Twitter, his handle, at Lazenby. Enjoy my first ever interview and this chat with Roland Lazenby. What are you currently working on at the moment? I'm finishing up my Kobe Bryant biography. Oh, I thought that was actually finished. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the last days of it. And is it coming together as you hoped for, you planned? Uh, yes, I have a good book. It's a uh, fascinating story. The real story, you know, when you write a biography, uh, you have all the context. And so everything changes and all the new facts and information, um, it just becomes a, a much larger force in explaining a person. Uh, let's start there. I wanted to ask you about that anyway. You've got the book coming, obviously, so uh, tell me what you can. But what was the most surprising thing you found doing this book? Um, you know, I wrote a book about Kobe in 1999 called Mad Game, the NBA education of Kobe Bryant. And, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time with him, and I knew him as a young player. I, I really did not understand the personality. It's uh, There are 
lots of revelations. The book comes out in August about a variety of things, including a ton of stuff about Jordan. And, you know, I'd, I'd have to think uh, that's a question I'm going to have to prepare to answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm still writing the, the last section of it. And um, there are a number of things. His, his story is, is not exactly what we think it is. Oh, is that right? Yeah, it's just a fascinating story. It is a cautionary tale, and it's tied up in the shoe industry. Uh, I, I, my publisher would get angry if I said more because they've invested a lot in this. And so um, I, let's just say the, the comprehensive view is very different when you when you set out to write a definitive biography, you're trying to explain everything. Uh, this whole family force that becomes a uh, one of these supreme competitors. Well, let's um, park the Kobe book aside. And, uh, I mean, uh, we can probably talk more about Michael and his book, I know because it's out. What was the most surprising thing about putting that book together? Because I've followed him for a long time and there were certainly parts in that book that were – very, very entertaining and interesting to read, actually. Well, thank you. You know, I, I really tremendous effort because Jordan is such a cultural icon. Um, and it's really, uh, in so many ways, important to racial understanding in America because I really don't think we have a lot of racial understanding. And because we really don't have a strong sense of our own history in this country. Uh, and I think that's a, probably a, a function of the age, but also a function of human culture. And so I really worked to dig in and understand the entire life force of the Jordan family going forward. And, boy, that began to shape so many things about Michael. And it, it allowed us to view him differently in some ways. He, for whatever reason, had the God-given gift of timing on more than just the basketball court, right? Right. His, his life was this amazing piece of time. He happened along and it, as eras were unfolding, technology was changing. The game itself was changing and uh, American culture ha had really fallen into this thing of shoving itself at the rest of the globe. And so many of those things, of course, the, um, the emergence of Nike and the role his image suddenly played in blowing Nike up beyond what anyone could fathom. All of these things sort of roll together in this force. You, you're right. There were so many points that could have gone either way, and they weren't sort of like a 50-50 bets, were they? For instance, like going with Nike. I mean, it was really, a at the time, it was, and correct me if I'm wrong, more of a 95-5 a bet in respect to where the companies actually were. And then to choose the options that he did and have them work out in uh, such a favorable way, it's unbelievable. There's many points like that, the choice of shoe company being just one of them. Right, and the, the, the contract never had Nike given a royalty to any player. It took this player coming out of college, and Sonny Vaccaro was so insistent and lo and behold they gave him this royalty and you know jordan became very angry with nike and he wanted to leave and uh, when he looked at everything he simply couldn't because the deal they gave him as we see today he's making you know he's the deal they gave him became his own brand because they had given him the royalty i mean Nike didn't even realize what they were giving him. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it allows him today to, you know, to rake in on 90, 100 million uh, off the court in, in revenue. It's, it's an astounding thing. It's the gift that keeps on giving in, in major, major ways. Well, as, yeah, as you, as you put it in the, in the book. 
has anyone else done that played in such a winning way that the basketball aspect and the business aspect? I mean, can someone like LeBron come anywhere near uh, Michael in terms of earning money through a shoe company? I know he just he got a reasonably large deal recently, but can anyone replicate that or are, are the shoe companies and athletic apparel companies wise to that now? Uh, they're wise to it. The deal they've given LeBron is is interesting. Uh, the 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 great difference for LeBron is that he is not a great shoe salesperson. He can sell phones, uh, but I was visiting with a top shoe industry executive who uh, at one point played a role in Jordan's uh, life, played a big role, and this executive said. You know, it really is amazing. Um, he He's an important piece to Nike because having him is critical. And they they blew it so badly on Stephen Curry and allowed yeah. Under Armour to come in and sign him. And, you know, that has allowed Under Armour to, to really uh, grow. And, uh, it, you know, for all of Phil Knight's competitive nature, he missed out on Curry. But LeBron is their centerpiece. He he sells shoes okay, but he can really sell phones. If Nike gets into the phone business, it will be even better. But no, <laughs> no one has sold like Jordan. And Jordan's legacy shoes obviously continue to sell as well. You probably understand this already, but... I ride my bike on uh, Saturday and Sunday mornings and I go down one of the major streets here here in Melbourne and every other weekend there is a line outside Foot Locker, Nike that is 50-odd people deep. They've been there all night waiting for the latest retro release and every time I see that, I just think that's, that, that is crazy success, right? I mean, it, it's just unfathomable. Uh, some of the stuff that has come out of... Um, I guess essentially putting a putting a ball through a ring, right? Way back in whenever he started in the eighties, it was crazy. Right. You you left out. We first connected because I asked about the unpublished pages from the life. And is there anything that you left out of uh, that book that you wish uh, could have stayed in and would have changed? Uh, I guess the way that um, that book has been perceived or our perception of Michael. Oh, you know, the book has been really successful. And by the way, thank you to Australian readers. I think there were six or seven, maybe eight or nine editions or printings of that book in the uh, Hachette International Paperback in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, the book has been successful. It's had a just a fabulous, uh, it's been out six, about six months in Italy and France, uh, it's it's been to many printings in Poland, uh, in Bulgaria. Uh, the list goes on. It's uh, it's coming out in Greek. Um, uh, the book has been successful, and I had a uh, a great publisher. Little Brown is is perhaps the oldest American publisher. It's owned by Hachette. I had a great editor. It was a Titanic challenge. Uh, to do that book, uh, it, it wrecked my health twice. I, uh, you know, I just had to uh, keep uh, plugging away at it. You know, it's more compression as far as what was cut from that. Now, there were uh, scenes and stories and things about the Wilmington riot, a lot of racial history. Uh, they they kept the main line of that, but I, I think readers would have gone crazy with all the stuff I had in there. And we streamlined, you know, the, the Jordans were moonshiners selling, making and selling illegal whiskey. Michael's people. Yeah. And I, I did all these fabulous interviews with a lot of the elderly Jordan men in North Carolina. Michael's cousins and whatnot, and uh, people who knew his great grandfather and his grandfather, and, and um, I just got lost in that world. 
because it was fascinating. To me, that's where Jordan got that. It was a very rough world. And Jordan, you know, has this nice appearance in ads, and uh, he, he really is this charming figure. But he's got this rough, rough edge to him. He's refined. I don't mean he's rough. Uh, he just has a hard edge, which is why he was <clears throat> such a an alpha male competing. And, and that really, uh, to me, is the Jordan character. And I just became fascinated with it. I went through 5,000 death certificates in this little county oh, down wow. on the uh, coastal plain of North Carolina digging out this story. And the editors at Little Brown helped me move on from it to make sure, yeah, there's a basketball story here. I did something of the same thing with uh, a Jerry West biography I wrote for ESPN. I'm really a, an Appalachian Mountain guy. My relatives were all hillbillies out of West Virginia. I grew up in Virginia. But I was fascinated by the Jerry West story, and uh, his backstory was incredible. And that book got the, the great reviews. Um, it, it wasn't a huge commercial success, but it got me the gig at Little Brown writing this Jordan book. And so uh, I still like to uh, attach basketball to our deep cultural story. My father was one of those old two-handed set out of the hills of southern West Virginia, so it was an homage to him, but it's sort of how I operate. I toned, I dialed it back a bit on the Kobe Bryant book. I have plenty of uh, family story there, but not quite the deep history. It's it's interesting because um, before reading it, if, for myself, I probably would have thought that that aspect. Would, I mean, going into a Michael book, I probably would have thought that aspect was a little bit um, not not boring, but uh, kind of um, uh, maybe not as relevant as what as as what it did become because it set up um, the story in terms of how far, which is what I wanted to ask you about, how far is the journey between, you know, Moonshiner to the most popular guy on the planet and what, what a, like, in your opinion, what allows that to take place? Because it's... Um, the more you think about it, the more insane that it actually seems. Right. And, um, you know, uh, one of the big factors there is that they were all sharecroppers. <clears throat> and we've conveniently forgotten sharecropping and, and how widespread. I mean, it was virtually the employment for, for so long in, in this country. It ended with the Great Depression in the 1930s. It was a failed economic system. But the South in particular, and, and much of America, was this failed economic system with all these landless farmers who, uh, who were left destitute. And they uh, became the people, in terms of African Americans, who migrated north into the American cities out of the South, into the ghettos there. And, you know, America has never addressed... Uh, the, all the social problems that came from that failed economic system. And so I, I just wanted to make it a personal story. And as I went along, you know, it's the kind of story that's hard to get people interested in. it. Um, by virtue of marketing, I set out to do this because the marketing of Michael Jordan had detached him from his African-American heritage by necessity or what the men who were marketing him thought was necessity. You know, he's got to appeal to whites. And so they, were, they weren't bringing that family story. It was always sublimated with Jordan. And my goal in writing the book was to connect him to that very powerful heritage. And... It, my instincts were correct there. It, it, and I really wasn't even aware of the depths of sharecropping until I found a, an agricultural report 
in the North Car- University of North Carolina library that had largely been ignored, but but was a fabulous report from 1922 with a survey of 10,000 landless farmers in North Carolina looking in detail at their plight. And um, that just drove me. You know, it, it was fascinating. And I guess Jordan has been many things culturally. In my book, he is a window to the past, which, of course, is a window to today. Most people just don't like to look through it. That's an interesting way of putting it, but so true that the gap that he bridged in such a short amount of time, again, is crazy. Every time I I find out something new, I read about him, I kind of have this, I don't know, it's like this pendulum that swings in my mind that sort of goes between that's so unbelievably unhuman, crazy, good to the other side, which is, wow, that's pretty dark and... uh, I'm not sure that if I had to deal with some of this stuff that I could still produce the what he's been able to produce. Like he, he seems to be able to go so far and operate at such extremes, if that makes sense. It does. Uh, you know, Kobe Bryant is a, uh, a similar personality. Uh, and one of the things I've set out to do in the Kobe book is to discover his organic personality because he'd been accused so often of being a Jordan mimic. And um, those personality types, I've been fortunate to uh, learn a lot from the the great psychologist and uh, mindfulness expert, George Mumford. Right who worked with both Jordan and Kobe Bryant. And to, uh, I mean, it's just been extraordinary. He has a a book out, The Mindful Athlete Now. But um, just to work with him in terms of the core personality and and understanding it, I think it's... um, uh, it, it, it's also sort of a uh, a walk into all of human competitive nature. But what is the most similar thing between the two of those guys in terms of their core character? Well, I think there's such competitors, and this was the focus. And it took Mumford a while to understand this, but all the efforts in in working with these guys was to try to help them find a sense of compassion as a human. But in the competitive format, they didn't have compassion for their teammates, opponents. They were just ruthless in in pursuit of male dominance. It was just a very raw, basic thing. And they, they had the physical ability they had the intelligence and and all of those qualities that made them very dominant figures and the compassion part first was to help them relate to less talented teammates and later became a function as a life skill to help them adjust to leaving the game because they had a switch that could not be turned off. And I think we saw this weekend, uh, at All-Star Weekend, a little bit of Kobe Bryant. He, he has a tremendous regard for George Mumford, as does Michael Jordan. They just prize the man. And... Um, I think Kobe Bryant flipped the switch off a good bit this weekend. He's had to. He's had an ugly, ugly season. It's been nice with the gifts at various NBA cities that he's received and the the accolades. But let's be honest. His play is, is terrible. The Lakers are terrible. It's a harsh, far harsher than anything that Jordan faced as an older player. But but Kobe never really has had his athleticism since he tore the Achilles tendon. But anyway, um, learning this compassion 
obviously was critical to them to encouraging them to play team basketball. And it, it, it really has become critical to them later. I wanted to ask whether they actually use their lesser teammates in a sense to drive themselves further. And I got the feeling on a few occasions with Michael that if things got, in the terms of a game, bad enough, then he was going to flip that switch and, and say, you know what, you guys aren't good enough, I'm going to get it done myself, and use that to actually drive more out of themselves. That's true of both of them, yes. And, uh, you, you know, um, both of them would use whatever device available to sort of push themselves to heighten states wherever they could find them and do it. Um, considering they're both guards, to do it, um, now Wilt could do it because he just dominated a, a, a virtually all-white league back in the, wasn't all-white, but it was, in a, you know, it was much whiter then, and um, th- there weren't the skilled big men. There was Bill Russell, but Wilt could dominate statistically with his great physical advantage. But um, these two, Bryant and Jordan, used their will along with their physical gifts of a... Uh, you know, if a player six six, much shorter to to do the kinds of things they did. So they couldn't rely on their size anyway to the degree that Wilt could. How would they have gone in, if, assuming their skills are transferable to a sport like tennis without a without a team? Could they have gone as far without being able to leverage off the team? Um, that's an interesting question. You know, basketball is such a dynamic, unusual sport. Um, I, I would say that the, the great competitors in, in tennis have those competitive qualities. Uh, you know, I actually coached, uh, a little bit of scholastic tennis back in the day when I was a young coach, but, uh, you know, I never encountered a figure like either one of those guys, but on the pro circuit, um uh, sure you know, you know those guys back in the 70s who sort of charmed the world tennis back in the 1970s was uh, a really hot sport i remember having wimbledon or attending Wim- wimbledon parties um much like a super bowl party <laughs> today I, none of that's uh none of that's uh, going on now that i know of maybe in just elite tennis circles but uh it was an item of popular culture and i, I now that you ask the question and it's an excellent question i i would say that competitive nature of born jimmy connors those guys they were uh you know rod laver some of those guys were uh they were great competitors you're still obviously doing a lot of stuff like hands on within the NBA as well as the book. Has either of the books distanced you from those guys at all? I mean, does Michael still talk to you now the life's hit the shelves? You know, when I covered the Bulls and wrote about them, uh, I got to where, and afterward, uh, you know, Michael's always been friendly. Uh, He shook my hand in Charlotte after the six months after the book came out. Oh, wow. We didn't have a long conversation um just to be frank if someone's going to pay those guys to do their own story it's going to cost millions and they can uh, the, the publisher can hire a guy like me and of course when people do their own stories sometimes they're really honest and even being honest isn't enough you have to achieve perspective I uh, I love memoirs, and I love to read the memoirs of, of famous and interesting people. But a biography allows you to go in and inter- – you know, I've done – for example, for the Kobe book, I've done 400 hours worth of interviews. Oh, wow. <laughs> 
And, and, you know, you're serving all the literature. And David Halberstam, the great American writer, told me once, you know, you, you really have to put yourself in a position where you're letting all the assembled media do the work, a lot of the work for you, because you've got all the reporters from all the newspapers out there interviewing. And some of that's true, really, to to ask the kind of questions you want. And David Halberstam was never able to get an interview with Jordan. We were both doing a book on him at the same time back in the 90s. And... Um, and I was because I was there every day following him around, chatting with him in the locker room, uh, really working to uh, make make him understand that I was a guy he ought to give some time to. And it's um, it has an effect, though. I mean, even the people you interview, um, the NBA is like anything. It's a closed society in some ways. And it used to be wide open. The PR people were eager for publicity and the writers could stretch out. I sat with Kobe Bryant in 1997 for 30 minutes, just Kobe and me in the locker room in Cleveland before he went out to win the slam dunk contest. <laughs> That's and cool. You just sat there ch chatting. I, I today you could never get there. You know, first of all, the the events are flooded with a thousand media from around the globe. And the NBA, the PR effort is all in managing and keeping the message just within what the league wants. And the teams back in the day always tried to do a very good job of creating a public face that was very different from the wild and crazy scene, uh, you know, behind the facade. And so the goal has always been to, I, I've been uh, sort of a curmudgeonly figure trudging around the NBA for years, sort of uh, hitting up people with interviews. And it's a, um, it's been a fun process, but, the other thing that is difficult is writing biographies about living people. My wife said to me, you know, you really ought to write some about some people who are dead. <laughs> so that, because it's almost like performing an autopsy on a living person, particularly when you get into details that are very hurtful and painful. And uh, I, I try to practice my own compassion. You know, the, 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 the allegations of sexual misconduct against Michael's father by Michael's sister was something that really had never been discussed in any mainstream sense. There were some dark corners of the Internet that had mentioned it a little bit, but not much. And I had to figure out a way to tell that story without hyping it. And to keep it very human, because the public didn't know Michael's father very well. It, he was a beloved figure. And Michael, as, as, as all people do, tend to love their fathers. And Michael loved his father. And I had to try to tell that. And I've had to tell some very difficult stories in the Bryant book. Uh, and you have to try to tell that, you know, we're all human. We and, and the goal is to to make the books I do as human as possible. That, you know, uh, God forbid that you end up sitting in judgment of people. Uh, the First of all, the, the issues with Michael's father were never adjudicated or even brought to authorities so who knows what the truth is there but the family was shaped by the allegations themselves that was my only point and we didn't want to hype that even in selling the book i think you read in somewhere before page 100 and it just sort of hits you and uh, you don't really see it coming but I just wanted to deal with it quickly. You could see the repercussions later of those allegations. I wasn't even sure I was going to go into it. I had a copy of her book, which had been published privately. 
and it was very hard to find, but I, I walked into the UNC Research Library, and there it was on Special Collections. Oh, wow. And, and so I knew that as a biographer, I couldn't run from that. I had to deal with it. And so I spent a lot of time thinking, how am I going to address this subject? And uh, that those kinds of challenges are, are what are important to a, a biography, but they also make a biography very difficult. Why do you think instances like you've just described, obviously one reason for it, but Michael seemed to grow apart from his family with each year in the in the league really and is that an inevitability of the the life and the level at which he was at that that's sooner or later going to be a sacrifice that you have to make right i think it is particularly for nba stars it is you know it's a uh, <clears throat> it's a league with a long history of sexual frivolity uh, coming out of the 60s and 70s in this country as the sexual revolution was sort of kicking its way over the ramparts. And uh, it, it, there's the level of temptation is just from traveling with the Lakers and the Bulls and the old Celtics with Larry Bird, the levels of temptation are, are insane. And, uh, you know, I, I don't really have an answer for that. I've been married 41 years myself, and uh, I was uh, sort of amazed. And I remember talking to the great Pete Newell, the, the great American coach who was also GM of the Lakers in the 70s and a longtime family man. And he was just blown away by the atmosphere that developed around the NBA in the 70s. I, and so you have to describe it. I, I don't try to dwell on it. When I'm doing a biography, I'm not really combing through Internet sites looking for stories about somebody's philandering. Or Now, I, I'll find something to illustrate that, and I'll make reference to it. But it's, it's, it's not really why I do these books. I guess the reason for the question was it seems to be pretty common, and I just I guess with in a sense that uh, it's the life you subscribe to, doesn't you? And that comes with some good parts and some bad parts. I suppose as everyone does to a degree. Well, that's why we have rock and roll and uh, all these other art forms. It was uh, whatever men could do to sway the passions of women, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, it, it begins with teenage boys trying to figure out how to do that, and certain people end up in certain circumstances, as Michael said, with with uh, unusual timing to where they are the uh, uh, object of adoration for large numbers of females. And uh, A.C. Green with the Lakers used to carry a Bible with him everywhere he went. Uh, on the team bus everywhere. And uh, he was quite a contrast to uh, most of the Lakers players who were open for business in that regard. <laughs> I was going to say from some but, of his teammates, yeah. And so it, it is definitely an area where you have to tread carefully, just in the sense of privacy. You know, I, I sort of subscribe to the thing. People... I have a friend in Texas who says everybody's got to kill his own snakes. And so people have to live their own life. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I want to describe that life. And there are many specifics I get into because there are revealing moments of character. There are all kinds of fascinating scenes built around this competition and the personalities and the uh, control freaks uh, that these coaches are and, and great players are. And so I, uh, I really en enjoy that part of it. I just, 
I, I don't really get into a lot of documentation. For the Jordan book, uh, you know, I ran into this guy who was a, uh, a bartender in a men's club at, in Charlotte. And he, uh, he had been a high school basketball player, had won a state championship, and was a huge Jordan fan. And, and Jordan comes in there one night oh, with... Charles Oakley, was that the story? Uh, right. Yeah. And, y you know, that story, nothing bad happened. Uh, Jordan's playing pool with some topless ladies. And it, it's a very comical scene. And Charles Oakley sitting at the bar telling the bartender, man, you know, welcome to Michael's life every night. And, and that's as far as I was going to, that was the perfect scene for me to, to tell that, that story. Was it really like that? Like every night for him? Like, is, it, is that true? That's what it was? Uh, well, you know, I had Lacey Banks there, who was something of a minister and the, one of the first African-American reporters in Chicago. And he and Michael had fierce competition playing ping pong, but they, they identified you know, Michael was a prisoner a lot of nights in his hotel room, and Lacey would sit there with him, and there'd be a knock <laughs> on the door, and there's a lady in a, uh, you know, in a raincoat with nothing underneath, pleading. And as long as Lacey was there, Michael was turning them down <laughs> because Lacey was, uh, you know, he was an older man and a, a guide to Michael. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I really don't want to speculate too much, but <laughs> Michael was known as a um, as a guy who enjoyed being the object of affection. I, I, I you know, I, that's about as much as I. That's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, what was it, the interesting thing about the actually? If you had to pick, do you take Michael or do you take Kobe? If you're a coach. Uh, to coach? Uh, no, if, if you were the coach and you're selecting you, you know, your first pick, is it Michael or Kobe? Well, you know, the, the great benefit and great timing of my life is that I became dear friends with Tex Winter. Oh, wow. The long assistant coach of the, of the Bulls and the Lakers. And I would have weekly phone conversations where Tex would – literally tell me almost everything going on with the team. Oh, really? Yes, Texas. Tex, uh, what a what a wonderful guy. What a fierce, fierce old competitor. And uh, I entered, you know, I gave Kobe Bryant, Kobe was this lost kid in L.A., and he told me he dreamed of, that Tex Winter was going to be his coach, and I gave him Tex Winter's phone number. And Tex was the relationship that saved Kobe, so I played a small role in it. But, but I also introduced Kobe to George Mumford, and so um, you know, Tex had an interesting theory. He and Michael butted heads a lot because he's such a purist, and um, but. Michael played three years of college ball under Dean Smith at the University of North Carolina in a very tightly controlled system. And Kobe had no benefit of that. And to, to Tex, that was a huge difference. Michael had some background. He had gotten away from that. But most people don't realize that Bill Guthridge, Coach Gut, Dean Smith's top chosen assistant at North Carolina, played at Kansas State for Tex Winter and, in the Triangle, and then was his assistant coach for several years before heading off on his career that took him to North Carolina. And so he had Tex, by virtue of that, because he had such a tremendous influence on Guthridge, had an influence on Michael, even in college. Now, Carolina did not run the triangle, but all of Texas system, his fundamental principles, all of so many of his fundamentals and things were that, that was sort of Jordan got a primer, a beginning there. And Kobe did not have the benefit of that.
The Bulls coaches who became the Lakers coaches, the Jordan coaches who became the Bryant coaches, spent a lot of time thinking about that question. Obviously, Jordan had better control of his hunger. He was more disciplined because of his background. It was still very tough. Tech said it was a high wire act every night with both players trying to get them to harness this tremendous personal power they had just enough to allow the team to prosper uh, and not to not to douse it completely because the fourth quarter or at the end of the shot clock you're going to need that magician that that alpha male with all the magical skills when you're in a tough spot to to do what they do. And so, um, you know, it required uh, patience. And, of course, Phil Jackson had the ultimate patience. Tex Winter did not. He would get into people's faces. He gave Luke Longley fits. And he would get into Kobe's ear. Uh, you know, and Tex could, I mean, he could, he was just a ball of passion. He would get out of control. They would have to calm him down. It was very comical, but, but it could go over the edge too. So you, you, you had those characteristics in the player Michael and then in Tex as a coach, and that would make for some, uh, rather interesting practice sessions, I would imagine. Right. Uh, in the book, there's the thing where Tex is out there coaching and practice and Michael sneaks up behind him and oh, pulls yeah. the gym shorts down. <laughs> and there's Texas bare butt, as Mark File, the Bulls trainer, told me. There was Texas butt hanging out, you know. And Michael would Michael could be pretty cruel with Tex, too. I was sitting with Tex in Michael's locker room stall in 1998 before a playoff game. <laughs> and we were chatting. Is this the shoebox? And box? Uh, Tex, yeah, <laughs> and Michael, you know this. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a nut for it. I, I, uh, I can talk for hours about about some of this stuff. I, I think the, um, I used to be entertained by the, um, by the stories, but now taking a much uh, deeper l- look at the characters that you know can um, go to these places, it just gives. Me, I mean, for me, it just gives a, a whole new level of enjoyment. It's, I love it. Right, right. It's true. Uh, it was the. Um, it was amazing. I I uh, got the contracts to do the work I did, and I was doing um, lower level projects back then. You know, histories of the Bulls, or and I was working for small mid range American publishers, mid list publishing. But I always wanted to write biography at some point. Or, uh, but really, so much of what I was doing was out collecting the the raw experience, the relationships, the memories, the, the basis for... You have to do a lot of analysis and reflection in writing biography. And those years in the 80s, late 80s and 90s, when I, I was able to do that, on into the new century with the Lakers. That was sort of the, the raw data collecting for what I've been very fortunate to do with big, powerful, a big, powerful publisher now, a, a global entity. Uh, Hachette owns Little Brown. And so um, I've been very fortunate in all that, to be there then, to be at all the games and to meet the people and uh, have great fun, uh, you know, in old Boston Garden with those bird Celtics and in the forum with the Magic Lakers and Chicago Stadium. And I, I did a lot with the bad boy Pistons. I did travel with them in their championship years when they were hammering Michael. And so... Uh, doesn't get any luckier than that, Matt. Oh, yeah. You're, you're short of lacing on a pair of boots. Um, you've, you've done really well. That's uh, credit to you. It's awesome. Well, uh, what, what do they say? Even a blind hog 
can find an acre in every now and then. <laughs> um, I had a couple of last questions, if that's okay. I'm not sure what your sure. time restraints are, but I mean, I could, uh, it's morning here and I could talk all day. But these kinds of interviews are great. They get me thinking about all sorts of things. I think the, ch the chatting is, uh, is cool. If I can just run a couple more questions past you and sure. then I'll, I'll let Certainly. you get back to um, your more important projects. And now, uh, These are supposed to be your toughest questions. The last ones. Oh, is that how it works? Well, I'm, I'm rather new to this, so um, <laughs> you put me under pressure, and now, and now I look at them. Um, actually, I'll, I'll tell you what. We'll circle back. You, ne you never gave me a, a, a one-word answer. Do you? Do you is, it, is it Michael or is it Kobe? I'd have to um, say Michael. Uh, he, he's, he had all the ability. As, as the coaches said, his hands were larger. He... You know, he there were things he didn't do as well as Kobe, but he was. They were both. Kobe really wanted to be a post weapon. He had to play with Shaq. He had all the post skills. Michael was a post weapon. Tex always said, "I don't know what would have happened if Michael had had to play with Shaq as a young player. It would have been the mess that Shaq and Kobe were." And so, if I don't get Shaq. And I need one of those guys to be the post weapon. I also think Michael is the, a little better post weapon, although Kobe was very good. He's balance, strength, and strength, balance, and the and the size of his hands tend to be the things that come up time and time again in that comparison. Right, and, and you know, Michael. I mean, Kobe was a kid and a lot of charisma, but he was goofy in ways. Michael was. Uh, Shaka Zulu. He was the natural, compelling figure, the great leader. Nobody wanted to displease Michael Jordan. Kobe's, when he got into the league, his teammates were screaming at him sometimes, you know? I mean, he no was one. so young, too, right? Right. And so he had a different road, a very difficult one. Michael hit that shot as a freshman against North Carolina, and he was ordained. There were various points along the way that um, it, tended, it kind of occurred again and again, but that was the biggest one, wasn't it? That was the one that it was a 180-degree turn, and he was on the way to a life that um, was going to be out of control no matter which way you looked at it, really. That ignited the worship. Now, it was... It was a small pocket of gas when it had, but it ignited and blew up. And uh, that that then was sort of on a delayed fuse as he as he got to the NBA. First, the North Carolina Tar Heels did not win another championship after that one. But as he got into the NBA and he, uh, a league with a coach in. Uh, in Chicago that just allowed him to explode. And he'd had that summer going against the NBA players uh, preparing for the Olympics. Um, Michael then hit that, and the, the Olympics themselves in Los Angeles, the, the next level of trapped gas. That's a terrible uh, way of describing it, but I mean, just own, I mean, just explosion in terms of interest. And it just, the NBA was, and the Chicago Bulls were just a pathetic organization then. And the NBA was really flaky. But he was such a dirigible. He, uh, you know, there's just global interest. It just took off. Did he ever, in the time that you spent with him, show any signs of fear in any situation? Well, he feared for me one day. I, you probably, <laughs> I was walking backwards and about to go off uh, a loading dock. I'd probably be paralyzed for life, if not dead, from the impact of my head hitting the pavement. Oh, wow. And he grabbed me at the last minute and kept me from going over. This is in the 95 playoffs in Charlotte. And... Uh, oh, yeah. Did I ever see any? No, I mean, Michael calmed everybody. I, he had that gaze. I was writing about this recently. He could level that gaze 
across the floor of an NBA game and chill everybody in the building. Back to the timing is everything comment that he made to me in 2008. Um, there may have been an athlete in another culture in another sport at another time that had a lot of those same qualities. I obviously didn't know Jack Johnson. Uh, I, 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 you know, they're, they're also go, go in any sport. I played rugby in college. So, uh, you know, it w- wasn't the rugby that, or, or the sevens or any of, of, I mean, we, we had fun, drank a lot of beer, but, um, there, there have been competitors in all sports, you know what I'm saying, that just have that fierceness, and uh, they chill everybody. But Jordan had it on a global scale. It began in that arena, but very quickly that, that gaze was leveled across the planet as well. I mean, he was mesmerizing. He really was. When I hear people who have been in the, in the presence of Oprah is normally the one that comes up the most, say that you can feel her coming down the, the corridor. What is the feeling like when you're around Michael and Kobe? Is it similar? No. Uh, Michael was had such a hero worship. I remember uh, sitting, and this is in the book, I was on press row at the University of Virginia. In uh, 1983, early, right, his sophomore year. And UVA had Ralph Sampson. I was writing a book on Ralph Sampson, the seven foot four center, because he had changed the sports culture in Virginia. I'm a native Virginian, and I wanted to do this story. And UVA had a long home winning streak. It's there in the book. And um, Carolina got a big lead, and UVA comes back, and Ralph comes down and is taking a shot from the left elbow, and Michael is down on the right block. It's still the most amazing play I've ever seen him make. And Ralph, you know, had great elevation on this jump shot, and Michael rose up from down the lane and came all the way in the air up to where Ralph was shooting and smacked that ball down. And all the people on press row jumped in fear. It was such a (laughs) stupendous play. And I was sitting with Michael 15 years later in Charlotte before a game, and he was sipping a cough cup some coffee out of a styrofoam cup. And uh, I asked him about that play. He, he remembered it immediately. It, it, it had surprised even him. And uh, that's when he told me that uh, that had been the fun part about his career. He had no idea. That was the fun part about his career. He had no idea he oh. could do any of those things. Now, I think the difference in Michael and Kobe is that Kobe knew. Kobe was bred out of the womb to be who he is. But Michael, you know, wasn't even one of the top 500 high school players in America till he showed up at the five-star camp. And first went about changing the fact that he wasn't in the top 500. Like, that, that was a coming out party in some ways where he right. surprised the right people. Right. And once Michael got that confidence that Kobe's father had just insisted on creating in him as a, from an early age, once Michael got that full confidence, because his father, of course, had denied him that, that kind of confidence, Michael was... Uh, he, he just carried himself in a superior manner without arrogance. I mean, he had all that arrogance, all that crap. But, he, you know, you would talk to him as a reporter, and he had just an ability to, to connect with you. I mean, you might be one of 20 in a crowd around him. And when you ask that question, you know, he, 
he was listening. He was a great listener. And he, he, you were in his, you know, full attention. Kobe was so young and such a cocky kid and could be uh, really nice and polite. But he could let that smirky kind of thing that people saw the day he announced he was turning pro with the sunglasses on the top of his head. That kid could come out. And that wasn't the guy that the Globe loved. Uh, now, the Globe loves Kobe. I mean, all those votes for the All-Star game that he's gotten. And, I mean, you know, if you're playing terrible, if you're playing god-awful basketball and they vote you in to start in the All-Star game, you have given people lots of memories. And Kobe has done that. You must give him that credit. Michael? Michael just had the it factor. It was, it resides out there beyond definition. Kobe was groomed from the start, as you as you mentioned. Is there any significant ways that his, oh, I assume it was his father, ensured that that was the path that he would take? Yeah, there's a whole book I'm writing about that. <laughs> Got it. Uh, <laughs> No, Don't worry, I'm going to read the book. <laughs> it's a father-son story. Oh, really? Very so they were close. I, I, I have little understanding of that relationship. If it's a father-son story, that's cool. I'm even more excited than what it was to get my hands on that. Good. I, I'm, uh, I'm eager for you to read it and tell me what you think, Matt. Yeah, I can, I can do that for sure. Look, um, Roland, I know you've got to get back to other stuff, so let's wrap it there. I want to thank you for the time today and, and originally connecting. I um, just wanted to thank you for it. I appreciate it immensely. Thank you for taking an interest in my work. Oh, no, it's, I'm, I'm clearly not the only one. It's great. Yeah, I mean, I lost touch a little for, for a little while there from the NBA, and that, that book well and truly uh, brought me right back. So um, I enjoyed it. I'll, uh, I, I hope to talk to you soon. Um, I took a recording this, so I didn't have to pause for notes. Uh, are you doing a podcast? I don't, I don't have any plans to at the moment, but right. it's certainly an aspect that I have on my list to kind of look into. Well, uh, what you do with it, let me know. Awesome. Thanks, Roland. Take care, man. Hey, everybody. It's Matt again. Thanks for listening. Just a couple of things before you guys clock off. You can get all Trench Talk episodes at xrm.com.au forward slash podcast. You can also sign up for other goodies at the same site. Just plonk your email in there and you are covered. That's X for X-Ray, R for Romeo, M for Mike dot com dot au forward slash podcast if you really like what i'm bringing you please head to itunes subscribe to this show and leave a review right there and lastly if you want to contact me directly type the at symbol followed by mr matt reynolds into your search bar and you'll find all the social links goodbye